Hi, um, my name is Susan Bell. I'm going to talk today about using discourse analysis in qualitative research. Um, I'm an Amherst Fellow based in Sydney, uh, specialising in qualitative research and um, other interesting things. Uh, um, this presentation today is the second part in a series in how to integrate some of the less familiar qualitative techniques into research projects for greater insight. So um, I need first of all to explain what discourse analysis is. As it says there, it's the study of how people use a language in social interaction. Um, and as here, interaction can be person to person um, and a lot of discourse analysis is about conversations but DA techniques and methods can also be used for any kind of inter interaction such as when we interact with uh, machines or when machines interact with us and the particular focus as you'll see here is that um, today I'm going to be talking about websites so it's when our clients have websites or products which talk to consumers is my main topic um, and it's about, as I said, how websites interact with us. So a little bit more on what that's all about by, by going through a case study. What um, I did for this case study was to create an imaginary brief modelled on a previous work we've done, which of course was confidential, but the, the basic procedure was uh, work it was, was common to the way we would normally conduct it. So my imaginary brief was um, about Australian charities and um, effectively pretended that uh, we had a, a charity client whose levels of donations had been falling and their membership had stagnated. So fairly typical core research project in many ways. Um, so the client wanted to commission core research to find out why, what was happening. Um, and our proposal was a, uh, is, for a stu uh, is for a two stage study. The second part is a traditional conventional qualitative research project with consumers. But the first part is the discourse analysis of competitive charities, which is what I'm going to explain next. Our objective in doing that first stage, the discourse analysis stage, is to reveal the discursive and rhetorical strategies used by charities, which is discourse analysis speak. Um, so if we want to put that into plain language, it, it, it means how do charities talk to consumers and um, how do they try and engage consumers. Uh, we use DA as a technique in many ways just to help keep it real, overcoming some of the problems in, inherent in the focus group method. It's part of the key belief about uh, what we do is that we can't simply rely on, on focus groups. Now, perhaps like you, I've done a little bit of, oh, a little bit of work with, uh, with charities and one theme that runs as a fault line effectively through all of that qualitative research into charities is that the relationship that people have between uh, victims and non-victims, there's, there's a tendency in, in qual research about charities for people to think that it's always about victims and it's always about them somehow being given the uh, responsibility of looking after those victims. And it, you can get bogged down in, in qualitative research um, on that topic if you're not careful. So that's one of the key benefits of, of the particular case study that I'm going to demonstrate. But first of all, a part of the reason for doing the case study is to show you how it's done. So um, that's what I'll do before we talk about the findings specifically. I've got here some very familiar terminology to you if you're a researcher. I've got the, the face sampling method, sampling frame, sampling criteria, and so on. Really, um, the methodology used in this particular case study um, is very much like choosing a sample for an in for in-depth as part of a core project. So um, what we commonly do is to include say 10, 15 in depth as part of a project. Um, and similarly, what we've done here is to include 10 charities uh, as part of our project. And we've, we've selected them and sampled them in the way that you would do um, an in depth project, really. So we, we had a sampling frame as a book, 
helpfully, called Australian Charities, and which lists, I think, all of them. Um, and what we wanted to do was to select 10 of those, and we wanted a mix of local and international charities, mix of health, environment, welfare, and, and, and animal charities, and there are other criteria, of course, we could choose. Um, and those logos there show you the charities that we used, and they are, as you can see, a mix of large and small, familiar and not so familiar, possibly. Now we looked at the websites of all of these charities and if you go to the websites you'll see that they are many, many pages long. So as is typical for any kind of research project, we needed to curtail it and give it some shape um, and some key parameters. So we simply chose three pages that were relevant to the brief, which is the home page, the about us page and the donations page on those ten charities. And what we did after selecting them was, not surprisingly, read them. <laughs> so that was the first step, was to read what they had to say, then identify the different ways that the, the websites express themselves, and in a minute you'll see how different some of them are. Um, and I'll also show you that the criteria that we use to, to describe those differences, the variables that we assessed. Um, then we grouped together the websites which express themselves in similar ways, and you'll, you'll, you'll see in a moment that there are four different ways, uh, and we explored the patterns as to what all that meant, as you would uh, with in-depth or, or groups or anything like that. These are the variables that we assessed and I assessed on the websites that, uh, the ten websites that I've shown you before. So we looked at who was the subject of their text, what was the main focus of what they'd written, what tense they'd used, what extreme words they'd used, what kind of modifiers. Those top ones there are probably the, the key ones that you'd use in absolutely any study like this. Um, Similarly, the type of verbs, whether it's a dynamic verb, an action verb, in other words, or more of a, a static verb, a, a stative verb would be something like believe or know. Uh, a dynamic verb would be something like fight, look. A pronouns, which pronouns are used as very, very revealing in terms of how they're engaging with us, because that's the point of this. We want to uh, measure, measure, identify, reveal how these websites are engaging with us. And we looked at other things like how long are the sentences, how long are the words, what style, and any kind of metaphors and imagery that they used there um, as well. So um, I'll go now to the findings, and I'm going to talk in detail about one of the charities, uh, one of the types of charities, as you'll see there are four, um, but won't be going through absolutely everything, partly for time reasons, partly for some things um, are confidential. Okay. What we discovered was that there are four types of discourse in the way these charities engage, interact with their target market. One of them is what we would expect really from qual research, which is a victim discourse. But there are three others, a crusader discourse, a hero discourse, and a helper discourse. So effectively what I did was to analyze each of the websites, group them together in the way that they, uh, in, in the way they express themselves, and then um, isolated the key theme that gave them their name. The first uh, one I'm going to talk about is the, the Smith family, which has a fairly conventional victim discourse. I think you will agree when you see. This text comes from their About Us page. I've put in red the, the items that were of interest to me, that were significant to me, and they were as listed in the variable slide that I showed you before. So they say, no one would deny. And that's an extreme word. That's one of the extreme words or phrases that we look at in a discourse analysis. And there are quite a, a few others in the Smith family uh, website. Uh, they also talk about children as being the focus or the topic of their website. Um, they are Australia's most vulnerable and precious resource. They give us a very precise number of 605,000 who are unable to access. There aren't any modifiers in this text here. They're not kind of unable to access or fairly unable to access. They are unable. Now then look at the next thing I've got there in red. Many of us 
enjoy and often take for granted. So they very much contrasted the children who are needy and us who enjoy. Uh, as it says later on, children are left out. Um, and then the bottom bit in red, caring and generous Australians. One thing that the Smith Family website did that none of the other um, nine did was to use an adjective to describe their donors or their potential donors. They just call them donors, <laughs> that's it. But the Smith family goes the extra mile um, and calls us caring and generous Australians. So what I've done on the next slide is to identify just some of those variables that I had on the list before. and showing you how it works for the Smith family. So they talk, their subject was the disadvantaged children who miss out. Their main focus was the children and us. Their extreme words are about no one would denying that children are precious. They used stative or static verbs, not active ones. We believe, they talk about we, and they have quite long words and sentences in a kind of lecturing style. So the question is, do all websites interact with us like this? Do they all talk to us like this and adopt this kind of tone? And the answer is no. Look at Oxfam. I know a couple of, uh, couple of the websites fell into this category, and I've called them crusaders. The red, again, are the words that I've identified here. The, the black and blue are their text. They start about them. They talk about we. We have been fighting poverty. They have a very active verb there, fighting poverty. So that's their subject. They also talk in a very different way from the Smith family, um, not only syntactically, but also um, in mood, really, that no longer victims, poor people can take control. How different is that from um, uh, the, 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 the children of the Smith family. Poor people can take control and solve their own problems. And they don't talk about us, they just talk about we, as in Oxfam. They use the word campaigning. Um, and the next sentence too, next two sentences are very, I think they're evangelistic. It's like, it's like a bit standing on a sermon and, and really trying to convert us. Poverty isn't just about lack of resources. In a wealthy world, it's about bad decisions made by powerful people. It's a very highly opinionated statement, and I'm not calling any judgments here on any of these websites, simply looking at the language that they used. Now, in interest of time, I won't go through all of the variables on the Crusader websites, but I think you can probably see from here how different the discourse is from, um, from Oxfam versus the versus the Smith family. And the kinds of things that we can do here are use these different styles of discourse to develop concept boards, to go into qual, or, or, or to, to shape our discussion guide, or help us design the qual, and so on. The next one is I'm going to look at, I, I call a hero, and really I wanted to call them a superhero because of the way they talk. Um, and again, it's really, really different from the ones we've looked at so far. The subject here is relief and care and commitment. Relief in times of crisis, care when it's needed most, and commitment when others turn away. Have you noticed there is no verb there? Um, that's supposed, it, it's a sentence and it's almost like a slogan, isn't it? Um, and they say that they're there for people no matter who you are, no matter where you live. So all of a sudden, we're not us, as in caring and generous Australians, um, we're not not in, even in the picture, as for Oxfam, but we're you. They're, they're suggesting that Red Cross will help us. And they also help tens of millions, which has to be um, a fairly extreme statement. Um, no doubt true, but extreme. But they do it like nobody else. So they very much have a kind of, we will come in and solve your problem. They're not about victims. They're about solving problems uh, in their discourse, the Australian Red Cross. Um, and finally, uh, the, f the fourth group um, of websites are a couple in this category. I've called them helpers. The Heart Foundation uh, describes itself very, very differently from, um, from the others. The sentence is in red is, um, I put it in red because it's long and it uses long words, um, and it's different uh, from, from, from the others. So they exist to save lives and improve health. Um, and so on, cardiovascular research, guidelines for health professionals. So they um, have a very different, they have a business-like, quite formal uh, approach to engaging with us. They're, they're treating us um, 
quite differently, aren't they, from um, from the other websites? Uh, and the other interesting thing about the Howell Foundation in their website was that they talk about the past. All of the others used a continuous present tense, but the others talk about the, they talk about the past. Over the past five decades, they have helped. Um, I don't know whether they intended the impression that comes from that, but it does sound about the past. So what we've seen here is that there are different types of discourse coming from Australian charities, um, and we can use that in uh, the following ways. <laughs> Yes, what we have learned. So what have we learned from this? We have learned that they show many aspects of the discourse with the consumer can shape the message that consumers receive. Just stopping there on that point just briefly, I don't believe, and I've done charity work, that consumers themselves could spontaneously identify these kinds of themes and these kinds of interactions and engagement style that we've seen. We had to analyze the message and then take that to consumers. We can't expect consumers to give it to us. The, um, the approach we used was done on text, but the same principles apply to face-to-face -face conversations and interviews. So we can use it before qual to help design concept boards, to shape the discussion guide. We can use it before quant to help design the questionnaire, and after qual as well to gain deeper insights into the, the subtext of what people have said and to understand um, other forms of client-consumer interaction. Um, and now I think Sue might help with questions. <laughs>